folks to think like I'm talking magic here like you get the one amino acid it's magical but sometimes a couple of them can make a very big difference in someone's life amino acids are literally your building blocks of signaling proteins and messenger proteins proteins we think of them like muscles right a lot of people are going to think oh we just need protein for muscle but actually we need these little amino acids the building blocks of proteins to help to signal or carrier molecules in the body why would you say that it is that it's so unrecognized i don't know i think maybe if i get you know conspiracy theory it's like financial right but otherwise, I think that maybe because they work in, in unison with a lot of other factors like vitamins and minerals as well. What's your experience around tyrosine? I venture to say that probably 80%, maybe 90% of those who have hypothyroid type of tendencies will benefit. Let's get to another more popular one that you've mentioned already, lysine. I am a big fan of lysine. It's helped with the immune system as, as a whole. That's kind of where I've seen it have its most effect. A lot of amino acids taste not good. Glycine is an exception. It dissolves like sugar, it tastes like sugar, but it's actually a pretty miraculous little molecule in all kinds of ways. Definitely the taste is always helpful. You can get people to take this as a nighttime cocktail. I do tend to use it quite a bit at night, um, especially after hard days at work. Recovery, incredible. Hey, this is Owen Robinson founder of Genetic Insights, Phil Younger, this, the Rejuvenate podcast, and forthcoming author of the books, The Rejuvenate Blueprint and The Phil Younger Diet. Yes, you heard it here first. They're coming out uh, hopefully later this year. Keep an eye out for them. So in this episode, I'm very excited to be able to talk about the power and effectiveness of individual amino acids. This is something I think has been criminally overlooked, not just by mainstream medicine, or I guess almost everything we talk about here is criminally overlooked, uh, but even within the whole natural, alternative, functional, whatever you want to call it, health world. Uh, there's a lot of focus on you know, detoxing, and there's a lot of focus on other nutrients like uh, vitamins, uh, minerals, you know, magnesium can solve everything, zinc can solve everything, D3 can solve everything. But there's very little focus in my experience on the individual amino acids. And so in this episode, we're going to focus very much like in terms of practicalities. And so for that reason, there's two parts to this episode. So in the first part of this episode, we have an interview with the fantastic uh, Dr. Janine Krauss, who is a naturopathic doctor, an acupuncturist, and a host of the HealthFix podcast, which specializes in optimizing mental and physical performance for women over 40. Now, she has a doctorate in naturopathic medicine, a master's in acupuncture, and a bachelor's in biology, so she certainly knows her stuff. But the reason I really want to have her on is because uh, when I had a conversation with her on her podcast, I realized she's one of the only people I've spoken to so far who realized the potentially amazing therapeutic effect of targeted specific amino acids and also the connection with genetics which is what I was on her podcast to talk about how certain people have uh you know increased need for amino acids sometimes significantly increased like an, an individual amino acid and how you know when you have an increased need for something and yet you have the same as everyone else you can obviously end up you're much more likely to end up with a deficiency and that deficiency can have very significant effects, especially over time. So uh, we, it was more like a conversation in the interview. I said we both shared as we went through a lot of our experience as to what does work, what doesn't work. We go through uh, each individual, uh, you know, amino acid that we've worked with, which is very awesome. And so I very much enjoyed the conversation. I definitely recommend that you listen to the whole thing in full, make notes. Of course, as usual, we do have annotations in the uh, episode description. So there's a specific amino acid amino acid you're really interested in hearing about, you could always skip ahead to that. But then I encourage you to go back and listen to the whole thing. Now, I also strongly encourage you to stick around um, and listen to the whole episode because at the end, I actually have a case study. So this is someone who I started working with not even that long ago. And, you know, when people choose to work with me, there's usually a process. It always starts with going for the DNA because that's the thing that I'm most qualified to do. Um, and at that point, all I'd given is a few nutritional recommendations, very, very little. I had referred him to a doctor, but he hadn't even been able to get around to doing that yet. But just through noticing a couple of nutritional deficiencies, um, 
he had such spectacular results that he volunteered. I didn't ask, he said, I'd love to, and he's not a public person in any way, you know, not active in social media or anything, but he just wanted to do it because he was so blown away that literally for 40 years, he had been suffering with this problem. Um, and, you know, he says in the interview, he spent hundreds of thousands of pounds, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, on trying to solve it and tried all kinds of modality and basically nothing had worked. And with the recommendations I made, like I wouldn't have even expected that they had the impact that they had on him. And, you know, probably the key one, the most important one that we talked about is a specific amino acid that he had an increased need for and that correlated perfectly with this extremely challenging problem that he'd had his whole life and had zero resolution for. So yeah, we talk a lot about the, uh, I'd say theory and our experience with Dr. Janine and I, and then at the end, uh, we, you know, I interview this person who I, uh, I'd worked with as a client who as a case study, and again, his health journey is not even complete. I'd say, you know, we're only 20% into the kind of process of why like to do with people to optimize them, but he'd had such incredible results just applying the first steps, which for those of you who know my system, you know, I, you know, if, uh, if it's doable, I like to start with genetics and building blocks first, because they're often the lowest hanging fruit. They're like the easiest thing that can get the most impact if done correctly, if done the way most people do it, haphazardly, they're obviously <laughs> often useless or worse than useless, but if done correctly, can have a massive impact. So. Uh, I encourage you to listen to the full episode um, and I encourage you as always to like and subscribe and all that. And if you're on YouTube or Rumble, I've noticed some people doing it there, leave a comment underneath the video, leave a question if you have any. Uh, I always reply. If you have a question for Dr. Janine, I'll reach out to her uh, and see if I can get a reply for, from her too. Uh, so I think that's it. Enjoy the interview and enjoy the case study. Hey, Dr. Janine, thank you so much for joining us at the Rejuvenate podcast. Thanks, Salwan. Thanks for having me on. So um, would you uh, tell us a little bit about your background, please? And uh, what made you so you know passionate about health um, and uh, helping people? Sure, sure. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm an acupuncturist and host of the Health Fix podcast. And, you know, the biggest thing that brought me to health was really watching my mom go through her cancer treatments as I was a teenager and she was just battling and uh, 10 years of it. And so at some point during that journey, I decided, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I, I noticed that she was loving seeing her acupuncturist and her naturopathic doctors and went into some of the visits and thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. So had to try it out for myself. And here we are today. <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, I went for the same thing um, in my, as a teenager, or even in my 20s. But um, I, honestly, at that time, it didn't, it wasn't in me to go, oh, I'm going to like learn how to do this. Um, so it's, you know, it's quite early to dedicate yourself to something like that. Um, so, you know, maybe it showed that you had a natural proclivity for it. Um, and then, so from there, from like, did you go straight to college and train to be a naturopath or was your route more circuitous? So what I did was I, you know, I was 15 when I really figured out natural medicine was out there and acupuncture was out there. Honestly, like you were saying, you know, when we're young, we kind of have these ideas. I mean, I was like pro snowboarder or naturopath acupuncturist. I don't know. You know, it's it's so, so wide varied in between the two. Right. Um, but no, I I I went to regular school undergrad. I have a I have a bachelor's degree in biology. I kind of did the pre-med thing. And what I did was I took it and left it open because I was like, you know, I want to look at the regular medical school thing. And I took the MCAT. I did all the things and was like, ooh. Yeah, I just I cannot pull the trigger on regular med school. I love the idea of all the tools. Plus, I could do acupuncture and naturopathic medicine at the same time with Bastier. And so that's why I kind of went that route. But it was pretty direct. I only took a year off in between undergrad and Bastier. And, and I worked for SC Johnson Wax, of all places, <laughs> to um, play with bugs. And, and treat the bugs with uh, essential oils. And when I realized that, yeah, essential oils weren't as effective in really knocking stuff out as chemicals, I thought, ooh, I don't think I want to hang around for what's next. So I ended up going into naturopathic school officially after that. So, yeah, that's kind of how it all went about. And how long have you been doing it now? I am in my 17th year. 
and uh, loving every bit of it. Of course, there's ups and downs, but ultimately at the end of the day, being able to educate folks on on true health and, and wellness is awesome. Fantastic. And so we met when I was a guest on your podcast, uh, The Health Fix, talking about genetics. Uh, I will link to the episode in the description if anyone wants to. I'd recommend checking that out. And, uh, you know, I was struck by your level of... Um, depth of understanding, but also breadth. Like you seem to know a lot about a lot of different things, which I always appreciate in uh, <clears throat> someone in the health world, because I think it's really necessary, you know, um, as much as, you know, specialists are very helpful with specialized situations. I think, you know, when you're talking about something like naturopathy or functional medicine or whatever it might be, often you're getting people coming in with a very broad, diverse set of symptoms that often have you know, uh, that are not specialized, like you often have in uh, conventional mainstream medicine. Um, and so it's very good to have that, you know, very broad understanding of health. Um, would you say that you have any specialty, you know, despite that, uh, so you have a breath, but is there like a certain thing, like I suppose to me, it's anti-aging, hormones, genetics, is there something like that for you that you, that you specialize in that you most like to help people with or just the kind of person that you've ended up seeing the most often? You know, honestly, I, I gravitate a lot more towards women's health and, and menopause hormones. I see a lot of guys too, which is um, because the wives bring the guys in. Um, in fact, I've got like a little niche of sorts in terms of firefighter medicine. In, in the Tacoma, Washington area, I see a lot of firefighters. My husband used to be a firefighter as well. And so nevertheless, I, I do, like you said, I, I do kind of see it all because I functioned as a primary care doc for so long. But if you ask me like, OK, like, what do you really kind of see over and over again? I would say it's thyroid hormones. And also I'm dabbling in a little bit of the healthy aging. I don't want to say anti-aging. I want to say more of like the healthy aging, keeping folks moving, fit and adventuring for as long as they possibly can. So I'd say that's where I kind of hone in in the niche department if, if I had to go there. Otherwise, yes, I am somewhat of a jack of all trades when it comes to this. And, and that, you know, as you know, with like you were mentioning, with, with seeing broad symptom bases, I will see a lot of folks who are pretty darn sick and they've seen 20 plus docs and they're like, hey, what's your take on this? So I do do a lot of that too. But I, I love, I love diving in, you know, I love exploring and figuring out like what, what makes this person tick and what's their unique body, you know? all the cells, all the DNA. <laughs> and that's why I wanted to speak to you because when I was talking with you, I you know, was talking about nutrition and genetics and I was sharing how I see a very frequent pattern that when a person has a genetic tendency for an increased need for a certain nutrient, then when we look at the tests that would, uh, you know, like blood tests or maybe uh, urine tests, saliva tests, where we look at someone's actual nutrient status, um, very often they are actually deficient in that thing that they need more of. And then I started talking about amino acids and how I'm surprised at how often amino acids have a way bigger effect, I think, than most people realize that. So for instance, an increased need for a specific amino acid, which is a specific building block for a specific, you know, a neurotransmitter or hormone or a process in the body. Um, and then the person not getting enough of that will kind of create a cascade of problems, which ends up being very, very significant. And I was sharing all this with you, and to my surprise, uh, rather than being, you know, oh, really? You were like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with that. And you said you'd actually had, you know, many years of seeing those kind of patterns of the amino acid and the increased need and deficiencies and how it does correlate with certain symptoms and conditions and all the rest of it. And I said, I'd love to learn more about your experience of that. Have you ever done an episode or a, or a book or anything where we can, where I can hear more about your experience? And you said, no. And I said, well, okay, let's make one then. So, so that's the goal of this. So um, maybe we'll also talk about hormones and uh, other stuff afterwards. But my main goal for this episode is to talk about this uh, amino acid thing, because I think it is uh, very underfocused on people like you with clinical experience, meaning um, you know, you're actually helping real people in the real world. Obviously, uh, you're seeing patterns and you're noticing that, but I don't see you know, a huge amount. I suppose there is actually a fair bit of scientific study around it as well, but I guess I just don't see many health experts or gurus talking about it. I suppose that's more what it is than any kind of public platform. I don't think there's a book of like the amino acid cure or the amino acid diet or anything like that. It's just not like specifically well known. 
Um, so yeah, I'd love to get into that with you. So uh, first of all, let's start with the basics of people. Um, what are amino acids and why are they important? How about that? Sure, sure. They're literally the building blocks of your proteins, right? So when you eat protein, that's what you break the protein down into. And so the reverse is you can use them as building blocks to help with proteins. And proteins, we think of them like muscles, right? A lot of people are going to think, oh, we just need protein for muscle. But actually, we need these little amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, to help to signal for carrier molecules in the body. Because proteins are not just what, what we take and we make muscle out of. We use the protein, as, as you know, to the, the amino acids to make different proteins that can carry around hormones, that can carry around neurotransmitters, that can help to bind to certain things, messenger molecules. And so, you know, it's it's been overlooked quite a bit that, like you said, that there are certain things that can be deficient. And that's the one thing that someone needs, which seems like I don't want folks to think like I'm talking magic here, like you get the one amino acid, it's magical. But sometimes a couple of them can make a very big difference in someone's life. And so, yeah, amino acids are literally your your building blocks of signaling proteins and messenger proteins if we keep it that simple right now and and move from there yeah yeah fantastic so why would you say that it is that it's so unrecognized i mean you know even vitamins minerals essential fats all of these have kind of had their place in the sun and you know people have focused on them and talked about them being super important you know i've read a book about vitamin b1 i've read a book about vitamin b3 i've read a book about vitamin k2 i've read a book about magnesium i've read a book about iodine I've never even seen a book about lysine or methionine or anything like that. Like, what, why, why do you think that they have been so, you know, ignored even within the nutritional world, let alone in the mainstream medicine world? You know, it's a really great question. I think that maybe because they work in, in unison with a lot of other factors like vitamins and minerals as well, that could be part of it. Because you'll see, like, the, the different books on methylation, for example. And you'll see methionine, you'll see those different guys in that department, or you'll see different books on weightlifting, but they'll have it in a like branch chain amino acids. Or we'll have, you know, like what's really popular right now is the essential fatty acids. There's folks that are selling the bulk of them. And I think for some reason, there's this idea that they have to always be together and always be working sequentially. And and while I said before, like, yes, they, they do need the other things. It is interesting that there isn't a single book on like, yes, lysine for viruses, right? Or why are we not talking about just tryptophan or making serotonin or, you know, tyrosine for making dopamine? I, I don't know. I, I think maybe maybe if I get, you know, conspiracy theory, it's like financial, right? Mm. But otherwise, I, I don't know. I wonder if it's because it's there's just not enough research. Maybe that's possibly it. There's not enough backing to kind of go off this in, unless we went off of just in, what I'm seeing in, in the practice and other docs I'm sure are too. Yeah. Well, I think one of the reasons perhaps is because, you know, I've just said that people have a deficiency in amino acids. You've just said that people have a deficiency yeah. in amino acids. But I think the general consensus view, especially if you ask AI, which unfortunately I think is what a lot of people do these days for simple things. If you ask ChatGPT or any of the others, probably, um, you know, is it how common is a lysine deficiency or a tyrosine deficiency or something? It would probably say extremely rare. And if you went to your doctor, they would say the same thing. So maybe let's start with that for people who are a little bit skeptical. Uh, on what basis are we, as I'm asking you, let's say you, making this claim that, uh, you know, uh, amino acid uh, deficiencies are anything other than extremely rare? You know, maybe very elderly people who can't eat enough protein and stuff like that. But I think the conventional view is otherwise everyone gets plenty of amino acids. So uh, why, why um, do you have this view that that's not the case? What's it based on? Yeah. So one of the views is because we have a lot of people that are struggling with their digestive systems. And so if we go back and go, well, how do we get amino acids from our food? We have to break them down, right? We have to break down proteins into the building blocks, the amino acids, and then we have to absorb them. And when I look at digestion at, across the board, folks have gas, they have bloating, they have what we call food babies. You eat and the food sits in the stomach. And so it's going to be very hard to break down these proteins. Now, the other part of it is most, I mean, I don't even know the, the data right now on it, but a lot, most people that come into me have acid reflux. 
And a lot of people are on medications that are called proton pump inhibitors that will stop the acid production within the stomach. And it doesn't, you know, if you've listened to anyone in the natural medicine space, will say that more often than not, it's a lack of a stomach acid, not an excess. Now, have I seen excess cases? Yes. But it is more common that actually someone's on these meds because they have a deficiency in the digestive capacity of making stomach acid. And what I'm talking about here is, is hydrochloric acid. And we need hydrochloric acid along with pepsin and other types of proteolytic types of enzymes to break down these proteins to help us to get these, one, broken down from the protein molecules and two, to be absorbed. So this is why I think we have a deficiency in this case in the first place. And while people study digestion, we have a lot more drive towards the acid side of things than we do to the low acid side of things or hypochlorhydria if we want to get fancy in terms of terms. Yeah, in terms of the medications people take, you mean, right? They're much more like take antacids. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, we kind of all know that the money is driven towards pharmaceuticals, right? There's there's more money there. And so I think that's why the, there's a little bit there and why it's overlooked. We just don't have the data. But at the same time, there's not a lot of folks, unless you're in the natural or functional medicine space, where we would try one singular amino to see if someone's symptom changed, right? And in the case of like depression and 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 just feeling down, and especially now that I'm kind of working more in the perimenopause menopause space, sometimes you got to go back to you're, you got to put your like sleuth cap on, right? And you got to go back to like, listen to what the patient's symptoms are. I'm not eating a lot of protein because I can't digest it well. My digestive system, you know, is bothering me, you know, and, and you got to go back. And so, so it's not always like follow, follow the research. It's also really take a good look at the patient and their symptoms and listen to what they're telling you. And then you can go back to them and be like, huh, okay, these things, these things match up. And while these conditions may be considered rare, we might need new data. I mean, yeah, we might just need new data <laughs> out there. Yeah, because I, I do find that like lysine does help correct a lot of folks that have cold sores. And tryptophan helps a lot of folks, especially in the, the perimenopausal, but also hypothyroid folks for one reason or other. It's in that case. Go ahead. Well, yeah, just before we get to specifics, because I've got a whole list I want to ask yeah. you about. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So uh, when it comes to deficiencies, um, I would say, the, I, I agree with you. I think that's the primary reason because people are generally deficient in amino acids. But what about if you're seeing that someone is generally has enough of most amino acids, say 18 out of 20, but they just have a, you know, a significant deficiency of you know, a couple of amino acids. Um, in my case, I would look at, you know, there's one or two reasons for that. Possibly that they're eating a diet that is just very deficient in one, but that's kind of unlikely. The more common one that I see is that they have that genetic uh, requirement for just more than average. Uh, is that something that you see as well? I would absolutely agree. I would absolutely agree, especially in the case of folks who do go on more of a lower carbohydrate diet. I will see that they will have a higher need. And that's probably and then that's kind of what I've kind of went along the lines of like you know, I guess I'm going to say, assuming that that is the case, if I haven't seen their genetics, that, yeah, they have a higher need for certain amino acids. Yeah. Yeah. I agree that we have genetic variants. So let's zoom in on that then. So you said a lower carbohydrate diet uh, yeah, will increase the need for certain amino acids. Can you tell us uh, which ones? Yeah. Tryptophan and tyrosine in particular. And, and what it is, is it's basically we use, even though you would think carbohydrate and tryptophan and tyrosine, you said they come from proteins. Well, grains have proteins too, not as much as meat products, but we will find that in those cases, yeah, those when some folks, not everybody, some folks do fine on the low carbohydrates, but I have a particular set of folks that they go on a low carbohydrate diet and they're just like instantly moods down. They're not feeling up. And it's not just you they're missing the carbs, right? This isn't just a carb withdrawal. It is that they are actually feeling the effects of low tryptophan and tyrosine. And that would make sense that some of the breakdown might be easier if it, you know, if we think about it, carbs are easier to break down versus protein in the form of meat. So it may be that they are some of these genetic variants folks. Mm. Yeah, I'm also wondering, as you mentioned those two, like in order to be on a low carb diet, your body has to do more uh, gluconeogenesis. 
Um, and in order to do that, it has to raise stress chemicals, including adrenaline and noradrenaline, and the building block for those is tyrosine. So I guess that's, that's another potential reason. Uh, so that's very interesting. I'm going to ask you about tryptophan in a minute, because I know some of our viewers are going to have very different perspectives on it, and I would like your, your input. And just one more question about deficiency in general. Um, so as far as I'm aware, the most common kind of tests for people who are like, oh, this is interesting, I wonder if I have an amino acid deficiency, would be like a blood test or a urine test. Um, I've done both. Um, yeah, before I share my experience, what's your opinion on those? Like how helpful is a blood amino acid test and how helpful is a urinary amino acid test? I use them quite a bit. So the metabolomics or the NutriEval by Genova are, are my go-tos for this. And it helps me to really sleuth back out based on symptoms because I'm always going back to the patient, right? Because data is data, right? It's there. But what is the person experiencing? So yes, I, I think they're helpful. Do I think that they are 100% foolproof? No, but I do think that they're absolutely give you some clues into what's going on for sure. So I want to hear your opinion. Right? Yes, yes. Both of those are urine. They use blood for the, the minerals and, and the vitamins. Actually, met metabolomics is just urine and NutriVal has blood for the minerals on that case. Yes, that is true. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, okay, but my experience is having done both. Having done the blood one was not very useful, and I think it's probably because your body keeps your amino acids in your blood in a fairly tight margin, irrespective of a deficiency. Uh, whereas with the urine we run, as you say, um, you know, quite often a person I've seen will have, like, perfectly adequate levels of, say, most amino acids, and then suddenly, like, they're excreting a normal amount of most, and then they'll excrete zero of, you know, a few of them. And that is indicating that there is definitely an increased need. So overall, in general, I'm, I prefer bloods to anything else for most markers, but I would say for amino acids, it's definitely an exception where I would prefer uh, urinary because it's, it's more helpful to see what your body's excreting, I would say, because it keeps it in a tight band in the blood. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, that's the only way I do it at this point. I'm so, I do it so much, I can't even think of the blood ones anymore. But yes, that's the only way I would do it. But I do agree with you. The other markers with blood could be are a lot more helpful when we're looking at white blood cell minerals and, and you know, different things, or red blood cell minerals too can be helpful, like things of that nature for sure. But yes, the, the other thing about the amino acids in the urine is you're looking at metabolism. Of, of someone's body, right? And so you can see where they're hanging up, where things are high, things are low. You can kind of look back and go, okay, you know, are they even eating like an excess of certain foods to throw off an amino acid balance? Because that can happen too in certain cases. Can you give an example of that from your clinical experience? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of times folks will be eating a lot of nuts, for example, and pineapple, things of that nature. And so that can throw off the balance, and, and it does a couple different things. One of the amino acid result balances is actually in the in the realm of bio, not bacteria, in the realm of bacteria and yeast. So it's a little bit different than what we're talking about today, but that is one of the cases. But we can also see elevated things like anserine, serine, those particular aminos showing up if someone's eating like a carnivore-based diet and they're not absorbing things as well. So I guess I should have been more clear on the f certain foods, but yes, it, it can show up differently depending on what specific food or what specific diet someone is on uh, in, in, in particular. When you talk about nuts, like I used to know a lot of people in the raw vegan diet, and I think when you get a lot of your protein from nuts, which is quite easy when you're trying to eat a raw vegan diet, uh, you can have too much arginine and not enough lysine yes. right, in, in ratio, and you can yeah. end up, like you said, like with viral issues potentially. Um, yeah, that's one of the only ones that I remember seeing that's like purely diet caused, um, is like, and I think that a lot of vegetarian diets even can sometimes be overly arginine and not enough lysine. Yes. Yes, absolutely. In that case, for sure. I think where I see it more is in particular of the bacteria and the fermentation of the yeast and the byproducts in that department with the specific foods. But if someone is more on carnivore, like I was saying, the answering serine, methylhistidine, those will show up higher, especially like I can tell on an amino acid test if someone's not absorbing the proteins that they're eating, you can see extremely elevated, but you can also see very low levels too. Even if someone tells you like, I am eating like 100 grams of protein a day, but all those markers are low in the aminos, you're going, you're not digesting. Like 
you're not getting in what you're eating. And so we can also tell that end too, in terms of those specific things. Yeah, and it happens. I, I just spoke to a person, a client the other day, who's a, a male, very large, muscular, certainly more than me. Um, and yeah, I could see in their uh, amino acids that most of their amino acids are low. Um, and, you know, they had a lot of problems that would correlate with those low amino acids. So interestingly, even, you know, someone who has plenty of muscle mass, they can still have this amino acid deficiency, which is, you know, most people wouldn't think of that. That's why I mention it, right? You'd think if a person's got big muscles and they must be getting plenty of amino acids, but it's not necessarily the case, right? It's true. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild. It's wild. It, it's why testing isn't very interesting to see kind of what is going on, what is showing up in these departments. Yeah. Genetic Insights provides cutting-edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy, and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. Okay, so let's go into some of my favorite amino acids and then we'll cover any of your favorites that we haven't already covered as well. Um, so one of the ones I mentioned uh, to you last time we spoke was about tyrosine. And I made the claim, which again, I have not seen any expert or research paper or whatever, that when a person has an increased need for L-tyrosine, which is specific amino acid that's considered non-essential because your body can make it out of another uh, amino acid, um, I see incidences of hypothyroidism. Like it, it, it happens again and again. And tyrosine, of course, is a building block for thyroid hormone as well as other stuff. So that's my experience. Um, what's your experience around tyrosine? Of course, there's other things it's related to like melanin and dopamine, adrenaline, like there's a lot going on with tyrosine. What's your opinion on tyrosine? What's your experience around tyrosine? And like, do you also look at uh, phenylalanine? Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I really do like tyrosine uh, for thyroid conditions. I do think it's, I, I venture to say that probably 80%, maybe 90% of those who have hypothyroid type of tendencies will benefit, especially if we've got other signs like the low dopamine, some of, some of those kind of signs where they're dragging, they're not getting out of bed, they're they're not motivated with the things that they used to be in the past. And and phenylalanine, yes. Um, I don't tend to supplement with it though. It isn't one that I have played with as much. Let's say, let's say this. I do tend to go straight for the tyrosine in that case and optimize digestion and see if I can get things higher level up up the the chain because so many people with with hypothyroidism in particular, will have digestive deficiencies and, and issues of that case. But yes, I do think that you're spot on that supplementing with tyrosine can be a game changer. And I, I think my question back would be, do you find that tryptophan and tyrosine together do better for some folks? Or do you feel like straight tyrosine? What have you seen in, in your case um, with working with folks? 
Tryptophan, I rarely recommend to people for reasons we can go into, we can debate that one next. Um, just, to, just to finish off on tyrosine first, um, can I just ask you, independent from tryptophan, which we'll talk about in a second, um, like some people say it's better to have it on an empty stomach because it's better absorbed. And I guess this is actually a good question for all the amino acids because there's kind of contradictory advice on that. Um, I am more of a fan, unless a person is severely deficient of having it with food, my kind of reasoning for that is first of all, that uh, your body's more likely to recognize and isolated anything as a food if it's with food, because it is gonna you know, interpret it as, oh, this is just a little bit more tyrosine in this meal rather than, oh, why is there tyrosine on its own? So <laughs> I don't know if the body really works like that, but it kind of seems that way to me. And the other more specific reason um, is if you include tyrosine in the meal then, uh, my understanding is that you get more of a dopamine kind of lift um, from the meal than if you were to not do that because amino acids do compete for absorption. That's also the argument given for having tyrosine on its own, that there aren't other amino acids competing for it. But I think a lot of people with a meal, they can feel sleepy or something. And a lot of people have coffee afterwards and stuff like that. And so to have tyrosine with a meal, I personally like, because I think it gives people a bit of a dopamine boost. Uh, but if a person really had deficiency, I'd probably give them both. So that's me. Uh, what's your take on it? Is it better on its own it, with a meal? Is it case by case? You know, I think it's case by case in certain situations, but I would agree with you on meals. One, taking amino acids on their own isn't pleasant, um, especially when you're doing singular ones um, and you're not using a capsule. You're, you, I tend to use powders. Uh, for for most of my amino acid supplementation. And a lot of times I'll have people with it under the tongue um, if I'm trying to get quick uptake of, of something or like if it's glutamine, something of that nature. But in the case of, of tyrosine, I'm always going to be like with food just because I feel like it's a solid absorber that way and just over time. So I guess I have a little bit more empirical data than I have like, you know. Yep data regular data on that one so yeah i have to agree with you i have to agree with you food with it yeah <laughs> Pilgrim, that is yeah. great that's what we want you know you've got almost two decades <laughs> of experience working with this a lot so yeah this is what we want to hear from you this is awesome um okay fantastic well yeah let's move to tryptophan then as you've brought it up a couple of times um tell us uh you're taking it first and i'll share why I, I don't usually recommend it after yeah yeah i i i love to hear this i'd love to hear this for me I, you know tryptophan is usually I'm going to pair it with tyrosine. So that's kind of a caveat. I do tend to put them together quite a bit, especially for my thyroid folks. Now, tryptophan on its own, yes, 5-HTP is going to be more of my go-to, full disclosure, um, versus straight tryptophan if I'm not using it with tyrosine. So there are some caveats I have to think about. It's fun because no one's really ever asked me all these questions before. So <laughs> I, I appreciate it. You're kind of pulling it out of my brain for me to be like, well, how do you use that? Um, if I'm using just straight tryptophan, um, it, it's not, I have to be honest, it's not as common as using it with the tyrosine, but if I'm using it straight, I'm going to use it powder, going to use it with food, and we're going to use it in the evening because there is, of course, there's a little bit of that like sedative effect there, but I, I do gravitate towards 5-HTP a lot more. And I think that there is a synergistic effect between tryptophan and tyrosine when we use those amino acids straight together in capsule form versus powder form. So that would probably be what I would say in terms of how I'm using those. And that's what I'm curious on your end. Like, what, what, and, what do you not And also why, why I Tell guess. Me. So for, like you said, so tyrosine, you said to give people, you know, for energy, for dopamine, for thyroid. Uh, so why would you give someone tryptophan? Yeah, great question. So typically I'm going to be trying to boost a little serotonin, but I'm also going off of the line of if I can get more serotonin and I can also simultaneously boost a little more estrogen. Not that tryptophan boosts estrogen, folks. What I'm trying to do is it's a simultaneous approach. But what I'm trying to do is get the full on to mel melatonin, get the whole process of the whole chain going. Because I think a lot of people, um, if we give just 5-HTP, I don't know what it is, but I feel like it funnels straight to the calm and chill, which is great. But I feel like if we go one step higher in the body and let the body do its own thing, Granted, we got to have some, we have to be sure there's enough vitamin B6 on board there as well. Like the body's solid in having it, but I will use it typically to calm. I will typically use it for depression and I'll use it for perimenopausal funkiness. And, and the reason I say funkiness is one, 
having to do with depression, but also possibly having to do with a little bit more of the case of not feeling comfortable in your body. That's how I do it. Have you heard of uh, Dr. Ray P? No. Okay. He's quite popular among the viewers of this channel. Certainly not the only, but I don't know, I'd say a, a core percentage of people are big fans of Dr. Ray P. And um, he was a, you know, a biologist and a professor who questioned a lot of the kind of orthodoxy on a lot of different things. One of the things he questioned the orthodoxy on was whether, uh, you know, omega-6s were actually good for you back when no one else was talking about this. And of course, now that's become maybe not mainstream, but almost mainstream that actually probably an excess of seed oils, at least, and omega-6s are not good for you, that they're inflammatory. So he's one of the people who pioneered that. Well, one of the other things that he talked about is that uh, serotonin is not actually something that is beneficial. So a couple of data points for that. One of the, one of the other things that he said is um, that out of the amino acids, uh, you know that there's the ones that are considered essential and non-essential. Um, so the ones that are classed as essential, he claimed, um, are classed as essential mainly through looking at livestock and looking at what is necessary for livestock to kind of grow to adult, you know, level in order to be used as livestock. Um, that there were, again, as we said near the beginning, that there wasn't really enough evidence in, in uh, you know, human studies of adult humans of amino acids and the impacts that they have. But that in mouse, my studies, when you restrict tryptophan, when you restrict methionine, and when you restrict cysteine, all of those can increase the lifespan by, you know, around 25 to 30 percent. Um, so obviously, methionine and uh, cysteine, that's for a very different reason, uh, if, if it's true. But in the case of tryptophan, his perspective was that uh, serotonin is not actually a beneficial thing at all. It's kind of beneficial because if someone's in a state of, say, extreme anxiety or panic, it is true that it will calm them down. But he considered it to be, and I'm paraphrasing here, I, I, you know, if, I don't know there's a lot of Ray Pete fans and forgive me for not getting this exactly right, but basically that it's kind of more of a numbing agent rather than something that makes you uh, truly happy. And so it's true that, you know, being in a rage or a panic attack, then being, you know, being numbed is an upgrade in comparison to that, but it's still not an optimal state of being from his perspective. Um, he also, you know, there's a lot of research, and I'm happy to send this to you afterwards. Um, increased serotonin um, is definitely linked to increased uh, incidence of learned helplessness. So where, you know, the, 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 the thing with a rat, if, um, if you put it in water and it has to paddle, it, it will only do it for a few minutes and it'll kind of just give up and die. But if it sees another rat, like get out, then it will be able to do it for hours kind of thing, if you've seen that. So there's something uh, around serotonin will increase that sense of learned helplessness. So just giving up very easily. I actually correlate it to uh, like a dorsal vagal state, if you're familiar with the polyvagal theory. So the ventral vagal state, I would say, is more dopaminergic. Um, the sympathetic state is more uh, adrenergic or adrenaline and noradrenaline. But then the dorsal vagal state, where everything kind of slows down and shuts down and the animal goes into more of a hi hibernation freeze mode, I would correlate more to serotonin. So again, it can be helpful if that's the appropriate response given the stimulus, given the situation, but it's not optimal. Um, and then the last thing, uh, like I guess, against serotonin for me, from a practical point of view, it is often people when they're given things which raise the level of serotonin, like SSRIs or MAO inhibitors, they can be extremely dangerous. And a lot of the time they do lead to, you know, things that we're not supposed to talk about uh, on YouTube, people ending their own life or, or ending other people's lives. And, uh, you know, all of those kind of things that actually increase when serotonin builds up. Um, and from my experience, when I have taken substances which uh, uh, reduce serotonin, like uh, metagoline or um, uh, Cipro, um, like they're actually very beneficial and a lot of people who take those find them very beneficial. Whereas, you know, it's well known that even with things like 5-HTP and stuff, some people have a very bad response to them. So I don't think they're entirely bad. And, you know, again, you were talking about converting to melatonin and helping people sleep. And um, I think, you know, there's an aspect to that, that if someone needs sedating, that they are helpful. But I, you know, because of that reason, I don't consider them part of an optimal strategy. And in fact, if people need sedating, I prefer to go down the path of GABA or glycine 
rather than serotonin to help them calm down. Sure. Sure. You know, I absolutely agree with you. You know, I, I think that, that there's things to think about, right? Um, in the the space of, of where I'd work, yes, glycine is always going to be in there somewhere too. You know, there's definitely ways that, I don't want to make it sound like I always use these, I guess. Um, but it, it, they're just things, right? And and I think with anything, it's always test, you know, go back and test and see where you're at. You know, always looking back at how the patient is presenting, right? And, yeah. And if... I don't want to say, know, like, if... that's my perspective, but I, I, I gave this, you know, I think in a couple of podcasts recently, I don't think there's a single piece of health advice I've ever come across that is good for everyone. Right. <laughs> Including eating yes. any food, even exercise. There are certain cases where it's not a good idea. Like, there is nothing that is universally good for everyone. And so if that's the case, which I believe it is, I'm sure it's also true there's nothing that's universally bad for everyone. And I'm sure there are specific cases where tryptophan <laughs> or 5-HTP would be helpful. Um, so yeah, I agree with you too. <laughs> yeah. And I also think a big thing that, that we're, we're not looking at in the medical space and even naturopath or, or regular space or functional medicine is that we can microdose things too. And I think for some certain periods of time, because when menopause and perimenopause symptoms hit, that's where I specifically tend to use a lot of, of certain things where we tweak it. You know, like glycine combined with with five HTP or chips for sure. But yes, can serotonin syndrome happen? Yes, and it can affect the gut pretty significantly too. So yes, I agree that there isn't one specific like magic bullet. If someone tells you that, like Ron, um, you know, it's a matter of figuring out like what what things and tweaking it for sure. So no, I think it's cool that you know that there are folks re doing more research on it. I mean, I by no means am I have a specialist in the amino acid space. It's more just what I've seen over yeah, the years. Yeah, your clinical experience. No, that's exactly what I wanted you here for. I just, yeah, just answering a question why I rarely use it. I mean, to be honest, if I see someone who like obviously is low in tryptophan, probably my first port of call would be actually niacin. Like I think hmm. maybe they are low because, you know, it's very inconvenient sorry, inefficient, the conversion to niacin, and maybe that might be, you know, what's going on. But I, it hasn't happened yet, but I'm sure at some point I will give tryptophan to someone. <laughs> um, okay, let's move on. Oh, uh, my next one here is glycine, which we've already mentioned. So this is one of my favorites, partly for practical reasons. As you said earlier, a lot of amino acids, I think tyrosine tastes okay, but a lot of amino acids taste not good. Uh, people don't want them. Glycine is an exception. It literally tastes, it's like a white powder. It's, it dissolves like sugar. It tastes like sugar. It can be used as a sugar substitute. So that's very handy. Um, but it's actually a pretty miraculous little uh, molecule in all kinds of ways, right? Um, so tell us what you like about it and uh, what do you uh, use it for? Definitely the taste is always helpful. You can get people to take this as a nighttime cocktail. I do tend to use it quite a bit at night, um, especially after, after hard days at work. I mentioned I kind of have a little bit of the niche in the the firefighter department. If they've been on a fire and really been beat up by a couple hours of working on a fire, I'll tend to add in the glycine and magnesium, um, putting those kind of things together. I'll sometimes even add in a little L-theanine to, to help, which is, you know, not an amino acid that we have in our bodies inherently, folks, but just something that we, we can get from green tea. But I, I will pair them together, and that's kind of how I like them, recovery incredible for that's what i love with glycine is in recovery for sure i agree and I, I agree that's a great combination do you have a, what's your opinion on glycine is it possible to have too much given that people could use it as freely as sugar like do you, do you cap it at a certain level for people or do you think the more the merrier are you worried about it imbalancing something else if you take too much of it i typically kind of stay in the range somewhere between somewhere between three and five grams at the most um, a lot of companies will have it at four as the sweet spot. Sometimes they'll ramp it up depending on how much someone, you know, if someone's been skiing all day or hiking or something of that nature. I don't tend to go higher than that. And I haven't tried it higher than that. I'm curious if you have. And <laughs> and like I have seen with certain folks that if I had it on its own and not with magnesium, it hit, it can hit the gut at some of the higher levels for some folks. And I'm not quite sure the exact effect there other than you know, what's going on in that department and depleting. I'm not sure what it would deplete, to be honest with you. That's beyond my, beyond my level of knowledge. I think it would, 
deplete methionine, but I don't, again, I don't think that's a bad thing because I have a similar list for methionine that I did earlier for tryptophan. So, you know, as I said, there's some evidence that actually having that be lower is overall beneficial for, for longevity, even though there are specific uses for methionine. Um, I, I haven't used more than that at a time to answer your question, but I've definitely used more than that in a day. Um, I might, you know, have two or three grams three times a day, something like that. Um, and I don't find it excessive. It doesn't cause any digestive issues for me. Um, you know, I keep an eye on this stuff as well, like with Nutrel regularly to make sure I'm not creating any imbalances. And for me, it's been good. Um, I had a client recently who recorded a video testimonial that probably be out on this channel by the time uh, this comes out, who it changed his life having a large amount of glycine um, from having anxiety, chronic anxiety for 40 years nothing spent hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to solve it nothing worked and then by his own you know perspective uh he saw that it was he had increased needs in his um genetics he saw that he was low in his other testing and he started taking it and he feels like a different person and so i think in a niche case like that which i acknowledge is not common uh, or usual at least maybe maybe common but certainly not the majority of people uh, I think well over five grams could be fine because you're trying to, you know, replete a severe deficiency. But I would agree with you for a normal person, probably three to five grams would be uh, a good amount. I'm trying to think of how much is in like collagen. I think it's like 20%, right? And then it's about 20% proline, which is similar, and hydroxyproline, which is similar. Uh, I think your body can convert one to the other or they, they both do something similar. So I think... Even if a person had a high connective tissue diet, as most of our ancestors did, um, they're probably having at least 10 grams of glycine just from diet, if not more. So I think it also partly depends on your diet. I think if someone's eating a lot of muscle meat, like a pound or two of muscle meat, that I know at least some of my viewers are, um, maybe 10 grams of glycine is not in any way excessive to balance out the high methionine and other amino acids in muscle meat. Um, so yeah, I would say it's like case by case. You probably don't get many people eating pounds of meat every day, but uh. <laughs> not no no not that much. Um, not that much. And some of my firefighters maybe, but not the ladies in my practice. No, no. But I can see, you know, that makes sense. It makes sense for sure. Yeah, I I mean I think mostly what I've seen is like athletes that have a higher need for it for sure. Especially like anyone that's running a marathon stuff like that. I've definitely dosed it a little higher there. But not um, not to the level you're talking about. So, hmm, might have to look at that. And what's your opinion on blood sugar for glycine? Have you used it for that? Because some people say that it's good to have glycine at night, maybe just before you go to sleep, or even if you wake up at the night to kind of stabilize blood sugar. Do you, have you tried that? Do you think that's helpful? I've played with it for with a couple of patients, and we've used the finger poke, you know, to look at the the blood sugar two hours after they did it. They just, you know, didn't go to bed yet. They took it, and then they did it the next morning, and and it did seem like it went down like a couple points, but it wasn't like so much where I was like, oh, game changer. Um, and I've also had people with the CGMs on too, and and do it, and I didn't see anything drastic. Now, granted, I wasn't looking in anybody that was diabetic. We're looking at you know pre diabetic folks. So I don't know if it would have a bigger change there, but I definitely have heard that too. And you yeah, know, I was thinking more about hypoglycemia rather than diabetes or pre-diabetes, just to kind of stop the crash uh, as much is my understanding. But I haven't done any of the testing, so as I said, I don't know. I was curious if you had uh, <laughs> just just looking to see how it worked in the evening with folks and and see what would happen. Um, but I, I didn't see much of a change. And I was hoping, you know, like post, like two hours post meal that we would see the level, you know, say someone normally went up to like 135 or something like that. And and yes, that is diabetes glucose with some people who are in pre-diabetic can spike like that. I was hoping to see that it blunted it, like came down or stayed like in the hundreds or something. And I didn't see it do that. But I can see if we're preventing crash kind of stuff. Um, same kind of case. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I haven't worked at, on it enough in that department. It'd be interesting to test it there, and it might need a lot. I mean, I know with alanine, that's one of the other things that they recommend to take at night before bed to prevent the blood sugar crash. Because, you know, that's one of the explanations as to why people have insomnia, right? They're waking up because their blood sugar has dropped and their bodies had to increase adrenaline to, to raise it. Um, and with alanine, another dose they recommend is 20 grams, which... Uh, I did try, and honestly, I didn't think it made any difference. And the only difference it made is next time I had my liver enzymes checked, the 
alanine transfer rate which was really high. And that was seen by a medical doctor and he, he, he was like, oh, it's a bit weird, although, you know, doctors are weird, I don't really care unless you're almost dead. Um, and then, and I was like, I wonder if it's just the alanine. So I just stopped taking the alanine and <laughs> retested it. It was back to normal again. So, um, <laughs> so that is one of the things about taking huge amounts of single amino acids, like you were saying a few minutes ago, it definitely can be a risky proposition and it's not recommended unless you really know what you're doing. Interesting on alanine, because yeah, I've seen alanine be deficient on some of the amino acid tests and definitely linked with the blood sugar um, and ethanolamine too, I've seen also connected there. So I'm like interesting on on it bumping up your amino acids. I haven't supplemented anyone with alanine. I've more worked on how can we help them with their blood sugar in general versus going down the alanine route. But it's good to know that you're your your liver enzymes went up because that will save me one freak out if I did try it and then I see someone because yeah I haven't done that. <laughs> it was only one. It was only as it alanine transferase. It wasn't like all of them. It was only one. But yeah, that's the thing that made me suspicious. Oh, <laughs> um, so yeah, okay. So with alanine, you wouldn't supplement, and it's a pretty rare supplement. I think I had to buy it from them from the US. It's it's pretty unusual, so that's not a surprise. Um, let's go to another more popular one that you've mentioned already, lysine. Lysine, I I am a big fan of lysine, and if someone even even back in the days of the viral stuff that was going on, um, a couple of years ago, I was I was dosing people with some lysine Lola higher just to see how things would go because we didn't know what to do, right? We we're like, oh well, let's try it, let's see what happens. And and so, if I go back and I even think about some of the patients I've used it on, even back in the days of like hepatitis A, like if someone got a foodborne hepatitis, we've used some lysine in that department too. And it definitely worked to help. I don't think it was like the game changer by any means. But, you know, I do think that at three grams is kind of one of the dosing points. I have had folks go up to five in terms of lysine. I haven't like titrated it out except for in athletes where they will either have like a competitive event and then get cold sores after. So we've kind of put it into their their recovery protocols. I have seen where I've done it twice a day in that department, anywhere between three to five grams. But um, yeah, it's warded off cold source. It's helped with the immune system as, as a whole. That's kind of where I've seen it have its most effect. And in folks with long haul kind of issues or in cases of reactivated mono, in some cases, I've seen it be helpful. Others, I've seen it do nothing. So curious on your end of what, what kind of things you've played with it on in that department. Very similar. I mean, I had a very specific case of lysine where, uh, you know, it showed up as being deficient in my genetics and in my NutraVal. And then I started taking a bit and it was still deficient in my NutraVal. And I started taking more and it was still deficient in my NutraVal. And I started taking a lot, I think, eight grams a day it was still deficient in my neutrophil um, <laughs> so that definitely can happen i can tell you from experience um everything else made before i think tyrosine took a bit but then that went up and there was a couple couple of others uh isoleucine but yeah the lysine was stubborn and i i spoke to someone else before they said they thought that was a sign of a viral infection um that's a tricky one that is you know no one has found it but you know but it may be there and, and no one's found it that that is a possibility but the fact that I had a genetic need for it told me that that's got to be at least part of you know, why my body was so hungry for it. And perhaps because I was on a vegetarian diet for decades um, and it is low in a vegetarian diet. So maybe my stores of it were just also very depleted. Um, I think that's possible. Uh, in terms of other people, yeah, I've pretty much exclusively used it for immune health and or if it shows that they need it. Um, it definitely is a game changer for herpes outbreaks, as you said. Um, I think lysine with vitamin C is quite a good combo. I would just generally recommend to anyone who got ill for whatever reason. I mean, lysine is, in fact, so effective. I, I don't know if it's the case in your country, but in our country, uh, it's sometimes sold uh, alongside, like, Tylenol um, by pharmaceuticals. Mm. They'll, they'll just sell you, like, lysine. Uh, I think, is it Tylenol, paracetamol, ibuprofen? Maybe it's ibuprofen. But anyway, one of those things, they'll, they'll literally just sell that painkiller with lysine in there 
which is the only use of amino acid in a common over-the-counter prescription drug that I have seen. So I guess <laughs> there's so much evidence that even they thought it was worth uh, putting in for, for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, lysine in the immune system. I don't quite know why, because I've looked at quite a few of the immune peptides, for instance, and they're not particularly rich in lysine more than, you know, any other amino acid. So uh, I wish I understood better why it's so effective, um, but it seems to be, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, it's interesting because I definitely have thought about that too. Like, how does this fit in? And, and I've seen, like you said, the arginine, kind of the, the split if someone's way high on arginine and lysine is low, we know like, okay, how much are you hitting up nuts? Like what's going on over there? Do you like chocolate? Lot? You know, I, I'll usually drill them on that, but I will often on an amino acid test, when I do see the low lysine, like you had said, I have wondered if there is a connection, I don't know if we were taught this in, in naturopath school or not. It's been so long, I can't remember. But I was like, there is something about, in my mind, that'll trigger, like, does someone have a chronic underlying viral infection? You know, when I see that that low, and I don't think there's any data to support that anywhere other than I think someone, one of our professors maybe said something. I don't know. It's like burned in my brain to see that and think to myself, hmm. Is there a chronic low-grade viral? And I'll also see it on blood labs where the neutrophils and the lymphocytes are very close in number. And I'll think if I see that paired with low lysine, I'm going to be like, there is a low-grade something, right? <laughs> Whether it's viral, there's something going on as to an underlying infection. So it's kind of one of the things I do look at. But yeah, I, I have no idea where that idea came from. No, no. Uh, I think it may be. Well, I think it's probably because of the clinical effectiveness of it against the specific virus herpes, as you said, right? But um, yeah, uh, you just mentioned immune system there and white blood cells. Uh, have you noticed a correlation with allergies, intolerances or anything between any amino acids? Uh, I'm just curious. It's not going to come to me right now. But no, if there enough. is, I, yeah, do you, do you have any? Maybe no, you can no, jog I, my memory and then I can. <laughs> no, I, I, I was wondering because lysine is not effective for those at all, right? In my experience, unlike actual infections. So I was wondering if there was something in your experience, but no, no worries. Um, okay, let's move on to another one. What about taurine? I see a lot of people in the anti aging space who are like big on taurine, who think it's great, who highly recommend it. Uh, some people say that it's, you know, excellent for relaxation and calming, that it helps uh, GABA or increasing levels of GABA. Um, I've seen all kinds of other stuff, you know, DNA repair and uh, um, many other benefits listed. But what about in practice? That's what we <laughs> would love to get from you. Uh, do you ever use taurine? Is it good? Is it effective? Um, tell us your experience. I tend not to use it that much, to be honest with you. A lot of labs all come back on Torin will be high on folks. Like I would say about 75% of the whole tests that come back, Torin's high. And we have some data that, and I can't bring the source up, but at some point there was a, some research of Torin getting trapped in the brain and being good or bad, we don't know necessarily is, is kind of how, how the article that I read kind of shook out. It sounded like more on the bad side than good side. However, now we have all this other data, you know, with touring and anti-aging and touring and this and that. So I'm a little bit in the camp of like, huh, interesting. Uh, but yeah, I haven't really supplemented touring because I've, like no joke. I don't know if everyone's doing energy drinks that have touring in them. That's <laughs> I've also, I think... I may be incorrect on this one, but I think if there's a concurrent zinc deficiency, taurine and zinc, I'm not sure if I'm 100% on that one, guys, so I, I don't want to give anybody false information. But in my head, I'm thinking taurine zinc could be a, if they're deficient on zinc, taurine may be high. There's there's some mineral where taurine can show high when there's a deficiency. So I'm sorry, I don't have the correct data in my head on that one. That's okay. I actually have seen similar that often this taurine is quite high and... Um... I think Nutrival considers it to be a methylation marker. So it considers that there's some uh, methylation not occurring correctly when it's high. So I think it's good that I've asked, um, despite both of our lack of experience of using it, because uh, it's always good to hear both sides. As I said, you have all these experts recently who are pushing Tori and how great it is and you know they're feeding great on lots, you know, five grams a day or whatever. It's not necessarily good for you. I'm not saying it's necessarily bad for you either, but it, it, I agree that it's good to test before 
having taurine. The other thing that makes me suspicious about taurine is, you know, methionine and cysteine are you know, the two main sulfurous amino acids. Taurine is also a sulfurous amino acid. As I said earlier, both methionine and cysteine are linked to uh, reduced lifespan, or maybe put it the other way, restricting methionine and cysteine leads to increased lifespan. So the fact that the other sulfurous amino acids has the opposite effect, again, it may do in some cases, depending on this complicated methylation situation, but I don't think it's innately anti-aging anyway. So yeah, that's also my experience. Yeah. Oh, and side note, I quick peek just to get do myself a little fact check. The zinc thing that's coming in my head is protecting the brain from damage from taurine. I was, I was... I was lining in that one, correct, which, in the brain. So, which indicates that taurine can damage the brain in at least some cases. For instance, a zinc yeah. deficiency, as you just said. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Okay. So, interesting side note, like, have I played with it a lot? No, because typically if I if I have really high taurine, I'm just going to, my first thing is going to ask people about how many energy drinks are you drinking? Because you'd be surprised how many people are addicted to energy drinks more than anything. So, and if we do pull them off of them, then I will see the touring levels do go down in subsequent tests. So that's kind of my first method of action there. Um, I'm, I would say my, my jury's still out on supplementing with taurine. Interesting. Yeah, uh, it's funny you said that because although I understand, quote unquote, normal people drink energy drinks, I wouldn't think the kind of person who spends the kind of money required to assess the amino acids would be drinking energy drinks, but apparently I'm very wrong about that, so fair enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What about methionine and cysteine? I've mentioned that I'm not a fan, obviously, but you know it sometimes does show up that people are low. Um, you know, it's considered to, they, methionine is considered to be an essential amino acid. There are some common formulas that contain it, like uh, gut health formulas often contain methionine. Detoxification formulas, ironically, often contain methionine or cysteine or an acetylcysteine, a form of cysteine, or SAMI, uh, which is obviously a form of methionine. So uh, what's your take on them? I usually do not supplement with them unless I have no knowledge from a Genova test where they have the test where you can look at the methylation markers and see where exactly someone's off with the MTHFR mutation. And so I'll hone in. If I feel like I like they are just missing the mark on methylation, then I'll dive in there. Like say we've given them the methyl B12, and we give them the methyl folate, and we went up, we went down, and nothing's changed, then I will go towards, and, and in particular, these are my people who are super fatigued. We've kind of optimized everything else, and we know that they have a methylation defect. We've gotten them off all the junk food, you know, all that, and we're like, man, they're just still not getting there, and there may be some mood stuff. I will go towards the Genova test. I forget the exact name of it, but it's methyl it's a methylation factors test, so you can see all of the the cogs in the wheel, as I call it, where they may be off in terms of an imbalance. That is the only time I will supplement with those because I've seen Sam Ego real south on some folks um, I, when I was in school even. I, I think with any docs, we experiment, right? We start taking stuff, and if we're like, hey, Sam E, someone says for depression, great, let's try it. I've seen some people go pretty get pretty more depressed, let's put it that way. And and almost I've I've seen someone go borderline on the the manic side of things with Sammy. So I never I was always afraid of it unless I knew without a doubt there was something that showed up in a methylation test. I think you're hundred percent right, Sammy. It's funny, one of the things I do is help people formulate products, you know, for the market. So for people who are not testing anything. And a couple of times this person's been very insistent that Sammy is great. And I'm like, it's it's your formula if you really want to put it in there, but I'm telling you it's going to cause a lot of side effects in a lot of people. It's really uh, uh, no way universally good, despite the research that you're showing me. Uh, and I did prevent them from including it. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2 
And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. What about N-acetylcysteine? Because that's, especially when the whole uh, COVID thing hit a few years ago, there was a big thing in the alternative health world, right? About how this was like a miraculous amino acid. It's considered to be great for detox. It's considered to be a building block of glutathione, which of course is technically true. Although, you know, glycine is also super important and often low in people who are not having a lot of connective tissue in their diet, as we talked about earlier. Um, do you ever give people n acetylcysteine or is it the same policy? You, you want to be thoroughly checking that they need it first. I'm kind of half and half on that one. And here's why. So, so knowing the transsulfuration pathways and being honed in on it, sure. I'm going to look at that because we can see like how much someone needs of N acetylcysteine or cysteine in general, because I can look on a nutrient and see the cysteine levels and, and what's going on there too. Now I got to match it back with their symptoms, right? Do they suck at detox? Do they have like the worst immune system ever? But here's the thing too. And I think, you know, I'm sure you're already aware of this and a lot of people are I don't know if a lot of people are, is that we need vitamin C and E and alpha lipoic too to help with recycling of the endpoint glutathione once we get the N-acetylcysteine in there. And so if someone's deficient in all of those, I'm going to treat higher level and do the vitamin C and E, you know, and, and alpha lipoic before I try to do the N-acetylcysteine. Now, I've seen it be decent to help break up mucus, but I think guaifenesin is better um, when we're talking mucus breakup. Um, with N-acetylcysteine in terms of making glutathione, it's half and half. And I've seen some people's liver enzymes shoot up because of that same thing, the transsulfuration. And so, you know, if someone can afford to test, great, let's hone in and look at your transsulfuration. But if you can't, this is where if you take N-acetylcysteine and you feel like crap and you're not feeling better in like a week or two, then you know that that this is not doing it for you. Because, yes, it is kind of touted as the magical thing and then the connection with quercetin and all that, you know, it can get complicated. So yes, my 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 answer is that you want to use some caution with N-acetylcysteine and you want to know your your levels of your vitamin C and E and endpoint stuff. And honestly, at the end of the day, sometimes I've gone towards using glutathione itself, like a nebulizer if we're talking about a really bad, you know, upper respiratory or something of that nature and just skip over all the BS and just get to the point. Just, I was going to say, for me, yeah, done. yeah, sublingual, you know, uh, glutathione or, or IV or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. Right. I'm really glad that you said that. And again, I want people to pay attention because, you know, this is uh, uh, often you get this generic health advice. And, you know, you just said if it doesn't make you feel better in a week or two. But a lot of people, of course, are told if it doesn't make you feel better in a week or two, it's because it's detoxing you. So carry on. Right. So people need to hear this alternative perspective that that may not be the case. Um, let's move to another one, uh, the branch chain amino acids. Uh, I think we can cover these all together. Uh, often they are supplemented together. So there's leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Um, in terms of taste, you mentioned earlier, I think a lot of the amino acids we've talked about so far don't taste that bad. Uh, lysine's not much, glycine's sweet, tyrosine's sweetish, phenylalanine is sweetish, but Leucine, isoleucine, and valine are disgusting. And uh, if you ever have, uh, you know, an essential amino acids um, formula that you know contains all the essential ones, or if you even if you just have a very hydrolyzed protein other than collagen, any type of hydrolyzed protein, basically when when the protein is sufficiently breaking down into individual amino acids, it tends to taste awful. And that bad taste, as far as I'm aware, mainly comes from the branch chain amino acids. So they do not taste good. However. They are very, very important. <laughs> um, I think what most people think of them of for is for muscle. That's usually what they're used for by athletes or bodybuilders. Um, but they are actually a, you know, a very important part of the energy production process as well, right? Um, and they have some other important mm. functions. So yeah, please tell us a bit more about BCAAs, your, you know, in theory and also most importantly in practice. Yeah. In theory, yes, muscle recovery for sure. I tend to use them in my most sick patients, folks who are having trouble getting out of bed, functioning, you know, illness, chronic illness, whatever it may be, I will tend to use it. I will also use it in muscle wasting kind of conditions. 
I will also do it in certain cases where folks are, I think for lack of a better term, but anorexic, but not anorexic with the DSM, you know, diagnosis where anorexic is we just don't feel like eating kind of situation and we're dealing with something with the gut, maybe I will use it in that case. So yeah, that's kind of how I clinically use them. And usually in smoothies, because yes, they taste god awful. And um, pretty much most people, I I will put that with creatine um, often and and try to use those two together to rebuild somebody quite a bit. And, and those would be especially, and I do see a lot of the branch chain aminos being deficient and and it's the the one thing in the energy cycle like we've given them the b vitamins we've given them you know we we they have no heavy metals that are that are high enough to interfere i will do the branch chain aminos and be like all right just trust me on this one i know it sounds like you're going to be a bodybuilder but we're gonna we're gonna try this because i will see oftentimes more than anything leucine is the deficient one and you said getting out of bed so and you also said muscle wasting but so even again, if someone has plenty of muscles, but they can barely get out of bed, they're low in energy, you give it to them anyway, right? Because it's not only about muscle, it's also about energy, as you were saying, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because it's really just trying to revive someone. I think that's probably like if I'm on a revival protocol, it's literally doing the branch chain aminos along with, you know, whatever, whatever else shows up, right? But I'm always going to have them in there. Creatine, of course, is my other. Sorry, that's what I was forgetting. But yes, those ones I will tend to put together. Unless someone's got really bad kidney function, then we've got to divert a little bit. But in this case, I'm definitely going to have it because, yeah, the energy thing, nobody talks about that in the branch chains. You know, they're all talking about muscle build, muscle build. But if you look at the breakdown of those three and and how it fun funnels into the energy making systems, it's a huge factor. And we can see that on our testing too. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so BCAAs are in, uh, you know, all protein containing foods to some degree. Uh, they're certainly high in dairy, but there are a few amino acids that are really only found in dead animals to <laughs> put it as uh, explicitly as possible. Uh, creatine is one of them is my understanding. Uh, carnitine is another one. Carnosine is another one. Um, they are all essential to uh, the body, although, of course, the idea is that the body can make its own of all three of those, but often it's not going to make an optimal amount. So, uh, yeah, some of the people who advocate a high meat diet, this is some of their justification for it, uh, especially, you know, red meat, beef, commonly, um, is that it's abundant in these nutrients and they claim these nutrients are very important. You've certainly agreed with them in the case of creating, right, of very important. You consider it as something that's reviving people. Um, could you get into that a little bit more and maybe also carnitine and carnosine if you think they're related or we can do them separately if you feel they're unrelated? Sure. I, I think they're related. I tend not to, I won't supplement individually either one of those. I haven't, I don't even know if it exists to supplement it. They in definitely my mind. do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this, uh, acetyl carnitine is quite common. Um, uh, but also L-carnitine is often used because it, sensitizes androgen receptors so again your bodybuilder bros will use it to increase androgen receptor sensitivity but it's not necessarily a good thing there's a drug called meldonium i don't know if you're familiar with it that um is a performance thing from russia that athletes sometimes use and basically it um reduces carnitine um like it reduces the body using breaking down fat as a fuel and in kind of steers it more towards breaking down glucose as a fuel and a lot of people say it really increases performance so there's arguments for carnitine there's arguments against carnitine so i personally wouldn't recommend it either for that reason unless someone really wanted to increase the androgen receptor sensitivity if that was their thing <laughs> so i would agree with you uh carnitine as a supplement actually i use it it's pretty good i probably don't need to anymore because i i have beef these days a lot of it but um uh, it tastes pretty good um, and I feel like as I had a lifetime of not eating any meat, maybe uh, it still <laughs> feels good to have it. But honestly, I don't really know if it makes any difference. Um, so, um, yeah. So let's talk about creatine then. That's, it's the most important of the three anyway, I would 100% agree with you. Now, most people would think of it as only a bodybuilding muscle thing. You know, some people say it increases water retention, so it kind of makes you look bigger or makes your muscles look more uh swollen than they actually are and i think that's probably the limits of people's 
awareness, but you know, I've talked before on these episodes about there are people claiming to cure autism in children with creatine. You know, there's people, you know, claiming, like I guess you just said earlier, re reviving people, right? You're bringing them back from the brink of creatine. Like creatine is a super important nutrient. So yeah, please tell us more about creatine. You know, I think really in in the scheme of things, when I look at it, I'm looking at it more on the level of of, yes, if we can get more fluid into the muscles, the better. If we can supplement an addition with electrolytes, if someone needs that side of things, you know, it's, I never use it as a singular approach. Same thing with the branch chain aminos. I do, I do tend to pair things up. So, you know, when I'm looking at reviving someone, I'm thinking about like foundational, like we've seen on labs that their creatinine levels are down, meaning their muscle wasting. You can tell, you can see, you know, they're actively muscle wasting cancer patients, you know, folks of that in that department. So I think, you know, my bottom line on it would be, I don't think I would use it singularly as your magic bullet. Like anything I mentioned today is not a magic bullet of one thing, but I think as a, as a synergistic effect, I think it does work quite a bit. And I kind of like the muscle fluid, the, the fluid pulling into the muscle thing, because I think a lot of us do stink really at being able to bring the ions into our cells and bring the fluid properly into our cells, whether it's the muscle cells, whether it's our so regular cells, whatever it may be. So I actually like that side effect of it, the swole look, um, to pull things in and, and use, use it to my advantage by having someone have a little bit of like a Quintin's um, electrolyte ampule or I'm doing like relight or something like that, depending on what the person's up for in that case so yeah it's an interesting point i hadn't heard that before but it makes sense so i've said before a lot of aging is simply the process of drying out right so it makes sense that something pulling water into your muscles would be beneficial um now you mentioned about kidneys um I, i've debated this with other doctors on this show before like uh if you do supplement with creatine in the level of five grams plus as a lot of people talk about your creatinine in your blood probably will go up a bit I don't, my opinion, and I realize it is only an opinion, I'm not definitely right, but my opinion is that it doesn't, it bear, it, you know, the, the impact on kidney function is not significant, not massive at least. Um, just because, just because it makes the EGFR seem worse doesn't mean it's actually negatively affected kidney function. And if you take, if you do a cystatin C test or something like that, you can see it, it's had no impact on kidney function with that marker. Uh, but that's my opinion. I'm not certain I'm right or anything. What's, what's your opinion? <laughs> if people take a lot of creatine, should they be worried if their uh, creatinine in their blood goes up? Yeah, yeah. No, not necessarily. It's always watching the other markers too. Like, you know, we have GFR, which is going to be our filtration, but we also have blood urine nitrogen to, to double check us there. You know, we also have ratios. The ratios... I sometimes don't pay attention to because if you're high on creatinine, it's going to throw the ratio off anyway, so you just ignore it. But, you know, if I noticed that someone's creatinine was like, instead of like 1.25 or something, because usually I'm seeing like 1.17, it's not so far over the range that it's out of control. But if I'm seeing it at like five, which I never have, but theoretically, if I saw it at like five, I'd probably be like, eh, we got to back down. But, you know... It's a whole, it's a whole looking at the whole function, but also knowing where someone's kidney functions at before you dive into it. And if it really, you know, keeping a target on it, that's, that's how I would say it in terms of things, you know, yes, we have to watch because you don't want to trash someone's kidneys, but have I seen taking creatinine in a normal person who never had kidney function, you know, affect their kidneys? No, it's a, yes, it goes up. Yes. It's going to show up normal on laps, but I've never seen it like take someone who had normal kidney function and mess with them. But if someone has compromised kidney function, I just watch it. And if I see, you know, the GFR going down into the 50s, I'm probably going to panic a little bit more than I'm going to panic of it, you know, dipping from 80s to 70s or something like that. So and that totally at makes blood, sense. you're in it. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to look at the whole whole picture of the person, too. And how are they feeling? Are they quick? De are they dehydrating faster? Are they having kidney pain, you know, symptoms? Back to back to the person, too. Yes, yeah. We're talking about this specific thing again because we feel like, well, I felt like no one else has talked about it, um, but uh, it is only one small subset of a much larger body of work that both of us do. Um, 
So any other amino acids before we finish amino acids? And also when we were talking before, I know you said, you know, it's patterns like, you know, it's, it's, I think you mentioned if tyrosine and lysine are deficient and often you think this, is there any kind of patterns or any other amino acids that uh, you'd be able to tell us about? Yeah, if I'm, I mean, like we had kind of already hinted a little bit on it is looking at alanine and, and those and blood sugar too. That's another big pattern I look at. I also will look at back to the carnosine and and the the methylhistidine. And you had mentioned earlier to me about the allergy and and component. Sometimes I will see histidines very high in someone with the allergy. And I totally spaced mentioning that earlier. So now that my brain's coming back on point, I'm like, yes, I have seen that. So that's one pattern with allergies and histidines being up. I will often see histidine up and, and, and cysteine will be low in some of these folks. I will see that. The other thing, another pattern that I will see is back to the carnosine and the methylhistidine. And those ones I will often see either really all really high or all really low. And that goes back to looking at the digestive system, as I, as I mentioned before, because if digestion is off and, you know, like it's a very big clue by seeing all of those like one side to the other. If they're all in the high range, there's either two things, right? There's finding out like, OK, are they all eating? Like, Are you eating a massive amount of meat a day? OK, that'll show high. But at the same time, I also have to know because one, those are all markers of having leaky gut too and so if all of those are showing high and someone's eating three grams or three sorry three pounds of meat a day for example one you're not getting all your nutrients in and two what are you what are you doing to your body like what's happening because all that's showing up into your bloodstream are we going to have some negative side effects there so i tend to think about okay do we need to tighten things up in the gut if everything's low on those markers then i'm going to be like Okay, we've got either someone who's anorexic, someone who's not eating meat, you know, someone who's not eating enough meat, or someone who's not digesting it effectively. And so I tend to use those markers in terms of patterns for how how the gut's doing as a whole. And so those can be some of my really big like call outs as to like gut's not working, other side of things are working. And then my other patterns, back to what I had said in the beginning, because my brain switched on the bugs side of it. And these amino acid tests, we can see the bug side effects, right? So we can see the byproducts of, you know, the different aminos that come out there. And so instead of being your nutritional aminos, looking at what's coming out as the side effects of excess consumption of certain foods like yeasts, and things of that, like yeasty foods or foods that promote yeast growth in the body. And so those are other patterns I look for to kind of help me understand, are we interfering with overgrowth of yeast or bacteria that are then sequentially messing with your amino acid levels? We're blocking stuff there. Uh, and how are the bacteria messing or organisms, let's say, messing with the amino acid levels by converting one amino acid into another or through interfering that with absorption? Mostly else? absorption. Absorption. Mostly okay. absorption. And if we're looking at absorption of certain things, you know, if we had a full pattern, I've seen it all over the place in terms of certain, like, if I had to nail down an exact pattern, I didn't prepare um, for that. But, you know, are there ones? Yes, I, I have certain ones that I can tell on there. And um, back to taurine for a second, I have seen taurine connect in with overgrowth of bacteria and yeast in the gut, too. And, and so that is something else that is a clue in as to, oh, do we have excessive amounts of overgrowth contributing to this amino acid being elevated in that case? Yeah, because people often think of, you know, like candida eat sugar and then bacteria eat like, you know, uh, starches and fiber, but people don't realize, you know, bacteria also eat specific amino acids, right? Different bacteria like specific amino acids. Bacteria also like other things, you know, like polyphenols or whatever. Um, so is there any kind of... Um, does it ever show up that a person has a deficiency of amino acid and that actually ends up being like an infection as opposed to any of the other stuff that we've talked about? You know what? In in some cases, yes. I ha There's a lot more that has to do with it than just looking at the amino test. So I, I don't want people to think like the amino test is going to show you that completely. But in certain cases, yes. I will say yes. 
Yeah, no, I was just wondering if it's if you've ever seen it. Um, I don't get into the gut as much. Uh, I usually send people to other practitioners like yourself for that. So I was just curious. Um, fantastic. Well, um, Dr. Janine, where are you based? I am in Tacoma, Washington for my regular practice and then virtually the rest of the time. So I do what I call a hybrid practice. I'm 25% in the office and the rest of the time I am doing telehealth. From oh, fantastic. And can you do telehealth it. throughout yeah. the U.S.? I So coaching, consulting throughout the U.S., licensed practitioner in Washington State in Montana at this point. Fantastic. Um, so you, as you said, not only are you a wealth of knowledge on this specific subject, but of course, you know, one of the other reasons that we got on when we spoke is I think our visions are very much aligned. You don't like the term anti-aging. I do understand that. I just use it because people are familiar with it. But, you know, I branded mine rejuvenate and feel younger. I prefer, you know, more positive terms like that myself. Um, so we're both very much uh, on the same page about that. Before we finish, would you just mind uh, also sharing your approach to hormone optimization? Um, maybe sexual hormones. You said, you know, you know, you focus a lot on people in menopause, maybe thyroid as well. We've talked about that a lot on this, um, this podcast, but I'd love to hear your take on those two things because I know a lot of people watching or listening. One of the, well, one of the most common questions or comments I get is like, especially when I talk about hormone optimization is, oh, well, and this is all very interesting, but you know, there's no doctors who actually do this stuff. And so I've tried to feature <laughs> doctors who completely understand the perspective that I'm sharing and who actually do do this stuff, which is why I started the question of <laughs> where do you practice? Um, and so, uh, you know, I'd love to hear your take on optimization because my understanding is you're not someone who you know, you have to be in a really bad state and then you'll see someone and then you'll give them the bare minimum to feel okay. You're someone who, someone will come in and say, you know, I'd like to feel better and you, you'll be like, okay, let's, let's test you and let's find out and let's help you feel your best. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm going to test that. I, you can't get away with me not testing something because I do need to know what is going on within your body. I'm going to pair that to the symptoms you have. But at the same time, I do find it incredibly I find it incredibly useful to get the body, figure out your baseline, right, of your health before you start throwing hormones into the mix because they're kind of like last level when we're looking at optimization. So when I'm working with folks, my approach is to make sure we've got everything else in a pretty good state before we start to add hormones. And I'm not a huge doser of hormones. Microdosing is where I start with folks because I, I think a lot of clinics are giving incredibly huge doses that people, one, can't tolerate and can't detox and and now we've got issues going on and we'll throw amino acids we'll throw all kinds of things off same thing goes with thyroid hormones a lot of people are overdosed and not given um, a good blend of what they need and maybe it's herbal maybe it's iodine maybe it is also a bioidentical type of thyroid hormone in that case too and so my approach is to get the body balanced first use amino acids testing like the nutrivalor metabolomics and and other testing too and then from there start to get it, the hormones on board. And, and at this point, you know, I think it's very important to think about doing this consciously versus throwing a bunch of hormones in your body. And then you start breaking systems and the aminos will go off the rails in that case, as will vitamins and other things. Very good. And again, yeah, that is exactly in alignment with what I teach my forthcoming book still at the time recording this, you know, I talk about the first step is to understand genetics, just because that's your blueprint. Second step is the building blocks, the term that you used earlier as well, you know. And I absolutely agree that if someone is lacking in basic building blocks, you know, commonly uh, magnesium, we've talked about different amino acids, uh, you know, maybe um, you know, specific B vitamins commonly as well. Um, then when you throw hormones in there, like say thyroid, it's only going to make it worse. I just spoke to someone the other day who was very keen to get started on thyroid and they were very keen in general. They did all the tests I recommended, which is always helpful. Um, and I could see in their nutrients, like they were really deficient in certain basic nutrients. And I said, if you add thyroid into this and, you know, and if it's done well, it's done effectively, it's going to increase your metabolism that's going to make these deficiencies worse, <laughs> not better, right? So we've got to deal with this baseline of you having the building blocks you need. And it's possible, maybe even likely, depending on the situation, that if you add in all the building blocks you need, then you won't even need to add fire. Like your metabolism will fix itself. That also is not guaranteed, but is possible. So I 100% agree with that approach. 
And I think for people who are a little bit reluctant with hormones because it's unnatural, um, you know, Dr. Janine, hopefully what she said there would be very, uh, what's the word, comforting for you because you know she's not going to just throw <laughs> a large amount of hormones in there. She's only going to give you what you actually need uh, and then test regularly to make sure that it is the right amount, that it's not excessive. Um, and ultimately, as you said, focus most on the person themselves, right? How they feel, what symptoms they have, is it actually working? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's key, that's the key. Just keep, take the person in mind, look at the labs and create a plan and keep, keep revisiting it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on. As you said, I know that amino acids are not like the, the thing that you claim to be an expert in or anything, but as I said, there's such a dearth of anyone who, you know, does claim to be an expert. Um, and I was, you know, really fascinated by hearing about your um, experience. And I have been in this episode. I've learned a lot. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Um, I highly recommend uh, Dr. Jean's podcast, The Health Fix. It's been going for a long time and has a very decent size audience because it's good. Uh, people enjoy it. Um, I will link to that underneath in the show notes as well as the episode that uh, I did there as an introduction for you. Um, and where, other than your podcast, where can people find you, Dr. Janine? You can find me on my website, doctor spelled out J K R A U S E N D dot com. You can take a quiz there and find out what's accelerating your aging and we can help to get you back on track. And then also on Instagram, I'm at D R Janine, J A N N I N E K R A U S E. You'll find me there too. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate it. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, as always, like, comment, and subscribe, but don't click away yet. Remember, this is not the end of the episode. So I'm very excited to share this with you. This is a perfect example of what is possible with the power of uh, amino acids and also genetics. So this is a person who I started working with, hadn't been working with that long. We'd only done the first two steps of my seven-step rejuvenation blueprint, which is evaluating the genetics and starting to work on the building blocks that the person may be low in. And it's such a profound case study for a point that I often make about how amino acids, individual amino acids are often very much underestimated in terms of the power they can have. And uh, there's not much of a better example of that than this interview. So uh, with this person, please bear in mind that, uh, you know, they're not a public figure. They don't I don't know if they've ever done a podcast before or an interview or, you know, anything like that. Um, they just volunteered to do this out of the goodness of their heart because uh, they had struggled so long with this challenge, 40-ish years, as you're going to hear. Um, I'm not being vague, you know, for uh, any reason. We're about to reveal what it was and who he is and all the rest of it. But I would like, uh, you know, him to speak for himself. But I just wanted to introduce him. And, uh, you know, thank him very much for sharing his uh, story. And I encourage you to listen. It's being shared as a case study, but I would say it's also an inspirational story. It's also a story about what's possible. And that's what, really why he wanted to do the interview. As much as, you know, it's interesting to him that, the, you know, the particular intervention strategy worked, uh, I think the more profound point is you know, I tell the story when I go on other people's podcasts a lot about, you know, how I struggled for years and it was only through a, you know, very customized approach, personalized to me that I managed to, to get somewhere that I had to kind of work out on my own. Well, I'd help, but, you know, no one else gave it to me. Um, and, you know, years is bad to be suffering with something. Uh, but Andy, who you're about to hear from, suffered for four decades. And so I think it's very inspirational, you know, that he never gave up hope. Um, he always kind of, uh, uh, you know, kept trying different things. He's actually an extremely, uh, I'd say like a polymath, you know, he has a, a lot of different skills and a lot of different areas. I'm sure at least some of which are developed in the course of, uh, you know, trying to resolve this issue, but it's incredible, um, you know, his commitment to not giving up and, and you know, giving in and just accepting that he that he had to suffer and, and, and just live with it so uh please hear it as both uh, a case study or you know the way i probably am more likely to look at it but also an inspirational story for you because if you're listening to something like this maybe you're into peak performance optimizing that's fantastic but i know a lot of you are listening because you are struggling with something chronic maybe it may well be something that you've had for a long time 
And so, you know, be inspired. Not just that, I guess, he finally had a resolution, but also that the resolution was so easy, so simple, so cheap, so painless, like all the things that you would want a resolution to be. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hey, in today's call, I'm uh, delighted to be joined by Andy, who um, is a client who said that he would be happy to do a, a video to talk about a case study because the um, improvement that he had was so remarkable and so interesting at really how easy it was after struggling for such a long time. And I think, you know, the main motivation was to inspire people to know that even if you've been struggling with something like the issues that he has been for a very long time, uh, to not give up, to have hope and that the answers are out there. And in his case, the answers, um, you know, started with uh, looking at his genetics. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Andy, thank you so much for jo joining us. Thanks, Elwin. Yeah, good to see you today. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for suggesting this. Um, so if you don't mind, Andy, let's start with, I know you're keen to talk about all the improvements you have, but let's start with uh, just telling people like the main challenges that you were uh, suffering with that, you know, led you to be interested in... Um, testing your genes and then doing consult with me. Yeah. Um, well, I guess the main driver for me, which has been the driver for 40 years is, has been chronic anxiety and it's, it's a generalized anxiety and it gets kind of mapped out there onto a lot of different things. So there was traumas in childhood and, uh, my, my hope was that in doing lots of therapy, that the therapy would resolve that anxiety eventually. Uh, it didn't. It gave me lots of awareness and lots of insights and grew to know myself extremely well. Um, from this sort of therapy, that sort of leads on into different sort of other sort of explorations in my life of trying all different retreats and all different sort of yoga therapies and psychedelics and um acupuncture and i mean it's it's been endless over 40 years um and what i've generally sort of found with all the different sort of treatments that i've done is that i get a sort of feeling of initial improvement in that but then the anxiety would just gradually creep back in and it felt like my central nervous system was kind of just running on this fight or flight mechanism all the time and nothing would really sort of calm it down to any sort of permanent degree. Um, and it's, it's always felt to me like there's something missing, like someone either hasn't said the right thing or someone hasn't done the right thing with me, or I haven't allowed certain experiences or advice to come in. Um, but then gradually over the years, I just, I started to think, well, maybe there's just more to this. Um, Luckily, I stumbled across one of your videos, um, interviewing someone and going through their genetic test that you had done with them and analyzing the results. Something just clicked for me in that and thought, well, maybe there is something biologically going on that, that needs looking at. So yeah, sorry, you were going to say something, Elwin. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, maybe there's something biologically going on is a key understanding and I'm kind of surprised but not really to notice that there's quite a few clients like yourself where the biggest shifts they're actually having are not in like the obvious health issues like you know digestion or immunity or whatever uh the biggest shift is actually in how they feel in their emotional state which you wouldn't think is you know a purely physical issue because i'm not giving you any therapy as you said or anything like it um i'm suggesting purely physical uh, interventions um and we have to remember how we feel is rooted in biochemistry um could you give us an example of about, you know, how the, the, the anxiety was uh, affecting you? Um, how it was affecting me is pretty much in every walk of life. So even something as simple as a, a walk down the high street would fill me with some degree of trepidation. It's a general feeling that it's just not safe out there. And I'm not quite sure what I actually felt unsafe about, but I think just given early sort of childhood experiences, it makes me very mistrustful of people, um, mistrustful that life would look after me. Um, so yeah, sort of something simple like going to the high street, 
public transport would be a real big difficulty for me. Going away on the holiday um, would, you know, sadly sort of fill me with such fear um, rather than excitement. Um, meeting new people, standing in queues, something as simple as being in a queue in a, you know, in a supermarket, a panic would suddenly come on in me. Um, and that, that can make one feel quite sort of agoraphobic, really. Um, not, not wanting to go out as much as I should. So, so I've really limited my life to quite a severe degree over the years, um, of avoiding social situations, um, avoiding new experiences. So yes, yeah, so that's, that's been really limited. Horrible. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I can relate to that. I definitely had a lot of that early in life. I'm not sure if it was as bad, but I would also avoid stuff. I remember if I was walking down the street and someone else is walking towards me down the street, I would cross the, the other side of the street, the pavement to not have to, you know, uh, walk past that person just in case kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, I can relate to that. Um, so, and of course, if you are running on stress for such a long time or a uh, sympathetic kind of dominant, as, as we talk about, um, where your stress system is kind of always on, it will tend to create other health challenges eventually. Um, do you mind talking about like some of the other things that you came to me, you know, wanting help with? Yeah, sure. Well, things like, um, skin issues. So I'd always had psoriasis on my hands and nails, um, digestive issues, classic sort of irritable bowel syndrome, um, symptoms, uh, no, I've had to limit my diet so much over the years, cutting out dairy, caffeine, chocolate, alcohol, um, anything that's not just absolutely basic plain food would just irritate the hell out of me. And then there would be the brain fog that I'd experience, um, bladder issues at night, getting up three or four times in the night for a wee, disturbed sleep, uh, yeah, just really sort of fractured sleep, waking up many times in the night, um, and often waking up in a sweat, um, so classic sort of anxiety. I'd always been underweight, so I'd always hovered at around 70 kilograms, and, and despite eating pretty huge quantities, I mean, people can't believe how much I ate. <laughs> it just sort of seemed to vanish. Um, yeah, um, fasting all the time. You know, I mean, literally, you know, I could, you know, I always joke about it, but I won't set off a car alarm fucking past the car. <laughs> so, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, look, well, it pains me to say a lot of this, you know, because I'm kind of looking at, back at it now, kind of like it's, sort of feels like it's history. I cross my fingers on that one, but it's never felt so sure. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of why I came to you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing it. And that makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, I teach this in a lot of my, especially when I'm a guest on other people's podcasts, I talk a lot about like the basics that when your adrenaline is high, and I definitely think that's one of the things that was going on for you, then you can kind of still function, you know, you're still a successful guy, you work and all the rest of it. But um, the areas that your body considers non-essential often suffer, like digestion, as you said, all these digestive issues, like being underweight, which I also suffered with most of my life, I can very much relate to that one. Um, and so, yeah, if you don't mind, uh, well, I'll edit this out if, you, if there's any aspect that you don't like, but um, certainly in terms of what I initially recommended, um, it was only like the first phase probably of what I was going to recommend. And one of the things that I recommended was to uh, maybe have a medical intervention as well, which you haven't even been able to organize yet because of, you know, practicalities and stuff like that. Um, and so when I spoke to you, I was surprised at how much better things were already when we basically just got started. Um, and the two things that I saw in your genetics that we started working on initially uh, in relation to the anxiety were, first of all, that your body had an elevated need for glycine, which is a specific, uh, uh, both an amino acid, but also it works as a neurotransmitter. And it's a very calming neurotransmitter. Um, 
And then the second thing that I saw in your genetics is that you have a genetic tendency for low levels of DHT. And DHT is something I talk quite a lot about on this channel and in my work, but very few people are talking about at least the benefits of DHT. Um, but DHT is the primary male hormone, androgenic hormone, uh, that will um, stimulate GABA, which is your calming neurotransmitter again. So there are two very, to me, obvious areas there where we could increase your level of calm by by working on those two elements. And so we confirmed both of those things with testing, right? Uh, we're a big fan of uh, testing here at the Rejuvenate podcast. And so we saw that you had the genetic tendency, but then you actually, uh, you were willing, which I'm so glad about when people are, to do additional testing to confirm. And we did additional testing to confirm that you were low in glycine, because it was the amino acid you very much needed according to your neutral valve. And then we did additional testing to confirm that you were low on DHT. You're also not that low, but reasonably low on testosterone. Um, and so as a result of that, I recommended um, some basically just glycine, some also foods containing glycine. Um, uh, I think there was vitamin B1 as well, which is uh, can be a very effective uh, vitamin for reducing stress and anxiety if it's something that you need then again your genetics and then your neutral indicate that you're needing it um, and then several herbs to uh, boost uh, dht and testosterone and so that's basically you can tell me if i've forgotten anything there andy uh, oh yeah there was also l-theanine for um increasing gaba as well because i could see that you uh you know you benefit from that and there was um keep just following here Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Glutathione was a little bit of a, like on a little bit of a different subject. That's because it showed as being necessary in your, um, Nutraval that you had low levels of glutathione. And this made sense, as you said, given, you know, the, how long you've been struggling with this. Um, but you know, the other interesting thing was anyone who saw your normal medical test, cause you know, we did a normal medical test as well, would basically look at all of that and say, there's nothing wrong with you, right? And you probably had that experience before going to medical doctors who tested you and you're actually in pretty excellent health for someone of your age, if you don't mind me saying, which is 59. Uh, but obviously you're still struggling in these key areas and I don't think any medical doctor would occur to them to test for DHT, let alone give you uh, natural substances to increase it and it wouldn't occur to them <laughs> to test for glycine and, and just recommend natural foods and, and a supplement to increase it. Um, but yeah, so... That's the, that's the, the, the only recommendations you've done so far. Um, you know, we're, we're going to work on maybe a couple of other things to optimize, but yeah, please tell us about, uh, the results that you've had so far, knowing that we're not finished. Well, the big one is the anxiety. I, I, I would say that I feel about 85% better, possibly even more. Um, I've done, well, I've actually been to three concerts over the last month. You know, I haven't been to a concert for many, many years. And I'm, I'm sure all anxiety um, sufferers will relate to this, that getting on a train is one thing, and going through the underground is one thing. That can be provoking. It's absolutely fine on that. But when your worst nightmare is that train stopping in the tunnel for some sort of fault or you know, it's what happened to me the other night, so the train sat there for 10, 15 minutes. Normally I would have been climbing up the wall with that. I didn't even realize that I got off the train and I hadn't experienced even the thought of anxiety. I'm sorry. And it, you know, I had to kick myself and go, what the hell? What just happened? You know, and then sitting in the concerts, actually being present and enjoying the music rather than managing my own internal dialogue. You know, it's just, I mean, it's just, I mean that's a biggie. Yeah, so. It's fantastic. I mean, on a more profound level, uh, you know, not living your life ruled by fear is arguably the most important thing in life. I mean, not living your life ruled by pain, I guess it would be another one, but these are like fundamental things that absolutely ruin the quality of life in my experience. And I think in the experience of, you know, the majority of people watching. So, 
Uh, absolutely. I, I'd say that is a profound shift. Yeah, there is no life. You know, when you're suffering to that degree, it, you're just existing, really, and, and not taking anything in. Um, so that, that would be a big one. Um, my skin, my nails are all getting better. Digestion is, is, you know, it's heading in the right direction. As long as I stick to a pretty strict diet, then everything's okay. The, the farting's pretty much disappeared now. Well, um, that's, I mean, that's a, that's fantastic. Um, so my weight, um, I said before, I've kind of hovered around 70 kilograms all my life. I'm up to nearly 75 kilograms. And it doesn't look like it physically. And I, I have to sort of look at the scales a couple of times. Really? You know, because, but then I look in the mirror and sort of think, well, actually, you know, I look a bit beefy. <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, that's fantastic. Not... I think, and it's only been two or three months, right? So, yes, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I wouldn't, I would expect that maybe six months, 12 months, something like that, you'd probably go more to a, you know, a weight that you consider to be totally optimal. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll have to keep that in check, I guess, at some point. Um, so my bladder, you know, I've never been diagnosed with prostate uh, problems at all, but I was getting up many times in the night. Um, most nights I'm going without a wee in the night. I get through to about five in the morning and then get up for, for one wee, which, which I'm going to bed at half nine in the evening. So a pretty good stretch. Um, qual my quality of sleep is significantly better. I, I analyze it on my sort of Apple watch and, and the amount of time I spend in REM and deep sleep is, is much, much better now. Yeah. And the one thing I'd be slightly embarrassed to sort of say is that I think my penis is bigger You know, It's, it's yet to be confirmed by a second party. <laughs> But again, when I look at myself in the mirror, I think, oh, you know, something's changed there. So, yeah, bring it on. Thank you for sharing. I mean, very interesting. Um, again, you know, most people go, you know, that's not possible or whatever. But the main thing that causes the penis to grow is the hormone DHT. So uh, if that's your experience, um, it wouldn't be surprising. Because, you know, just to explain, uh, Andy, actually, just like myself, uh, we both have a genetically, a tendency genetically to have low DHT. So what that means is um, even if you're doing everything right and you're living optimally and all the rest of it and, uh, you know, following all the lifestyle and dietary advice that all the gurus say will make you well, you're still never going to have optimal levels of a hormone if genetically you have a tendency for it to be too low or too high because that's just the genetic tendency. Um, so with some of the interventions that we recommended for you, uh, they will have increased your DHT. And could that have that effect? Yes. As you say, we, we, you know, we haven't had this independently <laughs> tested or verified, um, but, uh, but it wouldn't be that surprising. Uh, admittedly, at my age or your age, it is unusual, but if anything could do it, it would be DHT. So definitely possible, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Um, well, that's fantastic. And as, what I wanted to, you know, you've talked about benefits, lots of areas. Oh, what about brain fog? You mentioned uh, yeah, yeah. that earlier. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it. Gone completely. Yeah. First yeah. 40 years of brain fog and not being able to focus and concentrate, not being able to absorb information. It's, it's, <laughs> it's gone. It's, Absolutely it's amazing. It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it kind of is. Um, and so I would say the important thing to emphasize here, first of all, obviously, that no matter how much you might have struggled, how long you may have struggled with anxiety, no matter how many things you may have tried, I know you tried a lot of stuff, Andy. Um, you also, what's the word, uh, you were able to afford to try a lot of different things. So you've done a lot of things that maybe a lot of people weren't able to afford. Uh, you know, you travel to different places, you've taken, you know, time doing different, as you said, retreats and therapies and all the rest of it. Um, and I'm not against any of that kind of stuff. And if that helps someone, then fantastic. But 
Uh, and I, I did, I don't anymore, but I did see a therapist for a while and it, I think it was helpful. But one of the things I remember I used to say to that therapist often is I think all of these issues that you help people with, they're more down to biochemistry than they're down to, you know, psychology. Like they're more down to the, um, the yeah, the chemistry than the wiring of the brain. I think that's what a therapist helps with, like rewiring and helping you to, you know, think in new ways and use new neuronal pathways and all the rest of it. A good therapist or a good therapy anyway um and all of that is good but if the fundamental issue is just that your whole biochemistry is overstimulated or maybe a better way to put it in your case would be um under calmed like you just didn't have enough of the hormone and neurotransmitters that would calm you down then all the talking and or other interventions body-based therapies as you say like psychedelic therapies you know retreats spiritual practices meditation, breath work, all of that kind of stuff I know that you've done, uh, it, none of it gets to the root issue because the root issue is that you're actually deficient in something because of a genetic basis that none of those things will address. As you say, they will maybe temporarily make it better because maybe if you do one of these things and it temporarily raises GABA or it temporarily raises oxytocin because you feel connected to everyone or something like that. But the problem is as soon as the effects have worn off, you'll go right back again. It hasn't addressed the root issue. So that's one thing is to give hope to those who have been suffering as long. And the other thing um, is just to point out that so far, and you know, we're going to do more until you're really 100% optimized everything. Um, but so far, we really only worked with the anxiety. I mentioned, you know, the glutathione as well. And okay, the B1 has other benefits. But the fundamental thing with everything that um, I had you try so far was all really just to address that therapy uh, sorry uh, just to address that anxiety issue even the um you know the testosterone and dht i know it has lots of other benefits but that was the the fundamental thing that we're going for and it's interesting that it's had so many as you say knock-on effects in all kinds of other areas that maybe most people wouldn't make that connection but as you're seeing it is all connected right as soon as your body goes out of that fight or flight stress state um basically because you've lived a relatively healthy lifestyle compared to most people, maybe because you had to, right? As you said, no smoking, no drinking, all the rest of it. Um, your body is in a position that it can fix everything itself if you, if you just get out of stress state to a large degree. And so, and that's great. I have to say, you know, I'm not allowed to say that I cure any disease or anything, and I'm not. All, all we did in this case is just give your body some support and it's curing itself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I would say is that, you know, I don't regret any of the work that I've done, you know, to get to the place I am now. It's, it's all been worthwhile. It's all been valid. It's been beautiful experiences along the way. But I think one has to be careful that uh, some, some of the things that I've done, I think, re have re-traumatized the system and perpetuated some of the imbalances that I've had internally. So it really does need a careful discernment of, well, what is actually good for me and what is bad for me. Um, but yeah, the, you know, get a genetic test done and, and just see what's going on. Uh, cause you could, for me, you could go through a lifetime and not know about this. You know, and it can just be some simple imbalances that could really help. And, uh, you know, you were happy to do additional testing, like blood testing and urine testing. How helpful would you say it was to kind of see it on the genetics, but then have it confirmed independently by another lab test. Do you think you would have been, you would have stuck to it as religiously if you hadn't have had that confirmation, if you'd only had me say it's in your genetics? And I, I don't know the answer to this question. I'm just curious. I have a lot of trust in you anyway, even without those um, blood tests, but it was very useful to have that confirmed. Um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, definitely. Some of the blood tests aren't cheap, but it's a lot cheaper than another, another 10 years of therapy. So that's the way I look at it. Yeah. Can you put a figure on it? I don't know. Like if for me, I can say, um, I spent hundreds of thousands on my well being before I found this stuff, which has really transformed my life for the last two years, very similar to, you know, what you started doing now. Uh, do you have any idea how much you spent before you found this, uh, avenue? Well, I did once work out that the psychotherapy was about 250,000. Um, and then if I add up everything around it, 
I think it's maybe 400 grand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Probably quite similar then. Yeah. And I'm not a particularly, not a poor man. I'm not a hugely wealthy man, but I kind of just, because my life was so limited, I, I really didn't mind prioritizing that rather than having a, a Ferrari or a, you know, a whatever, you know, I just, I just, yeah. I just knew what my value in life was, was to, to really live with presence and contentment and peace. Yeah. And it was the right thing to do. We're not making fun of either of us having spent that much money. I mean, what do, what do a lot of people do? They spend it, you know, uh, getting drunk and taking drugs to try and escape the pain. Right. So obviously doing therapy is way, way better than, you know, what the average it really was the best possible solution that you had available to you. Right. Just like it was for me. So yeah, it was the wise thing to do. Um, but, and as you said, I don't regret doing it. You don't regret doing it because you, you learn a lot, as you say. Um, but if there's one thing I do regret, uh, and I won't speak for you, you can tell me if you feel the same, but one thing I do regret is I wish I'd have, uh, learned about this genetic testing earlier and, you know, done it. I, I think I could have saved myself a lot of suffering and, uh, that's actually why I started genetic insights. Uh, and you know, that's why I'm promoting it far and wide as much as I can, just because, um, you know, if, if, uh, if I'd have had this insight earlier, I, yeah, I could have spared myself a huge amount of suffering. But what I would say is so that, um, I did do a genetics test many years ago, I think, and that was from a hair analysis mm -hmm. and it, it didn't have anywhere near the sort of level of, um, results that your test comes up with. Um, yeah, I forgot what I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think I get it. Yeah. Not all genetic tests are created equal. I think some of them, they don't give that much information. They're not really that helpful. I've seen, you know, some that, um, cause I did a lot of research once I decided to actually launch this company. I tried a lot of people's services. A lot of people, they give way less information than us. I did come across a couple of companies that gave kind of an equal amount of information, like a very broad selection like we do. Um, but they were completely inaccurate and I was actually shocked, um, about that. So, I wouldn't claim that we're the only company because uh, th there are several other companies that do do uh, th that have the same AI engine behind them that we do. Um, so out of those, we are um, the simplest and the most affordable. That was really my goal. But as I said, most other companies out there, yeah, the results they give are very, um, what's the word, elementary and basic compared to what we can provide. Well, I think what was important was the the availability to have a consultation with yourself afterwards, because I think if I just looked at a genetic test myself, it would have made no sense to me, but, but having yourself piece together or that's causing this and that's causing that and to, to have your um, knowledge to make sense of those uh, genetic tests was, was absolutely crucial. So yeah, definitely, definitely follow up consultation is, is really needed. Thank you. I'm not sure how long I'm going to be able to keep doing them with, you know, <laughs> as demand steady increases, uh, but maybe I can train someone else. And that's part of my goal as well is to create more and more educational videos, kind of showing people how to go through them and how to interpret them so that over time, you know, either people can do it for themselves or maybe, as I said, maybe I train other people who get it enough that they can then help people in turn. But yeah, for now, as the time of this coming out, I'm still available for consultations. I love doing it. It's, it's my favorite thing to do is to go through people's genetics. I find it fascinating. I find it interesting. Obviously it's very rewarding, um, when it helps people, uh, which it, you know, usually does. Honestly, often I don't, uh, hear much from the people unless I follow up because often I'm saying, like you have a medical issue, you got to go to this doctor and then they, they start working more with the doctor than myself. And so sometimes I hear from the doctor that they're doing better. <laughs> so it's very nice to, uh, uh, you know, that you keep uh, coming back. I don't know. We've only had two consoles so far, but you know, that you plan to keep coming back. So I'll keep, uh, hearing about your progress. Hopefully that's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keep it up. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much, Andy. I really appreciate your time, but I think more importantly, your courage. Um, you know, it's very ironic that uh, this is the first one of these we're doing. Hopefully we'll do more, you know, at least, a, I don't know, half a dozen more by the end of the year. But it's very ironic the first one I do is for someone who has suffered with crippling anxiety 
Um, and it's just a testament to, I guess, both your courage and your desire to help people. Uh, but I guess to some degree, proof as well, the anxiety must be less that you're happy to, to do this in a public forum. Um, <laughs> and so, I, uh, yeah, but, you know, I think no matter how little anxiety you have, you still have to have a desire to help people and courage to put yourself out there uh, in a public way. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, well, my pleasure. Well, I'm there. Only too happy. Genetic Insights provides cutting-edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy, and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment, and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.